And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than the sparrows. Psalm 23. chapter 20. We're going to look uh, specifically at verse number 12. We're going to talk about the other verses here in just a minute. But Exodus 20, verse 12, I'm reading from the New American Standard. If you had King James or a good translation, 
The word will be just a tad bit different, but we'll all end up in the same place together. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Let's look at that one more time. Everybody say it with me. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord God gives you. Let's pray together. Father, speak to our hearts. Let us hear your voice and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. Exodus chapter 20 is, the, is the, the famously what we know as the Ten Commandments. And if you look at Exodus chapter 20 and you look at the, the Ten Commandments are broke down in a matter of, uh, of uh, uh, five and five. Five commandments deal with your relationship with God. How you, how you function. And so uh, we won't, won't ask Willie to put it up on the screen, but if you have your Bibles and you are in the book of Exodus, if you look at Exodus uh, uh, chapter 20 uh, and you look at verse 3, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, that's number one. Number two, you shall not make for yourselves any idols or any likenesses that is in heaven or above or on the earth uh, beneath and the water below the earth. Uh, the third one, you shall not worship uh, anything except the Lord your God. Uh, then you sh uh, shall not take the Lord's, uh, the Lord's name in vain and you shall remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The first five of the Ten Commandments deal with your relationship with God. That's what God expects of you. You're to do these things. And listen, these are not outdated. They're not antiquated. And they didn't go away because Jesus came. Jesus didn't say, Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. And so these things here are not outdated, not antiquated, and not something that we said, well, we don't have to follow that we're under grace. We are under grace. But this is one heck of a good guideline for living your life and being a productive citizen and, and, and living the right way. Don't put God first. Don't have any other gods before him. Uh, don't worship idols. And keep this, don't use the Lord God's name in vain. And then keep this, uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's the seventh day. You're supposed to go to church and you're supposed to rest and do all those things. Then the second five of the Ten Commandments deal with your relationship with people, how we deal with each other. And so if you look at uh, verse 12 again, this is, starts it off, honor your father and your mother. Uh, verse 13, you should not murder. Verse 14, you should not, should not commit adultery. Verse 15, you should not steal. Verse 16, you should not lie. Bear false witness against your neighbor. You shouldn't lie on somebody. Verse 17, you should not cover your neighbor's, neighbor's house, your neighbor's uh, wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to, to your neighbor. And so that one just simply means that uh, be happy with what you've got and quit trying to steal other people's stuff. <laughs> and other people's stuff might be their, their husband, their wife, whatever, right? And so the second half of the five deals with our relationship with each other. And I'm going to ask you something. As you look at the five to deal with God and the five to deal with men, do you see any any of those five, five and five, do you see any of those that would be detrimental to society? I don't. Matter of fact, I see that if we put five, these five, the five and how we deal with God, the five and how we deal with people, if we put these things to work, I see a society that is much better than what we're living in today. It's a society that honors God. They put Him first. It's a society that... Uh, uh, doesn't uh, you, you don't have to worry about locking your doors. Was well, a time you used to not have to do that, ladies and gentlemen. You don't have to worry about locking your doors because your neighbor's not going to steal your stuff. Nobody's going to break in and take things because what we got to take a man that's guiding us that says we shall not steal. You don't have to worry about, uh, you go down through there and you look and you don't have to worry about, um, let's look here, you don't have to worry about uh, packing a gun on you. You know, you know, everybody's packing today. There was a uh, Supreme Court decision to come down Friday, Thursday, I believe it was, about open carry. Uh, primarily dealing with the state of uh, New York, but it had to deal with the fact that you were allowed to open carry. They can't, they can't keep you from open carrying a pistol. Well, you wouldn't need a pistol if we all followed the Ten Commandments because we'd all know that we shouldn't what? We shouldn't murder. We're not supposed to kill people. And so uh, we look at uh, verse uh, 15, we, we would be a much better society if we didn't steal. 
would have to worry about locking your doors or closing your windows or shutting it down like Fort Knox. When I was in Mount Sterling, uh, we used to leave the church open all day long on Sunday, uh, Sundays, so if somebody wanted to come in and pray, they could come in and pray. About middle ways of my time being there, we had to start locking the door on Sunday afternoon because people were coming in and taking stuff. Then eventually we had to we had to go from from uh, leaving it unlocked to locking it to then getting an alarm system because somebody coming in took our took both of our air conditioning units took our sound system they took our computer they took all this all the stuff there's a big there was a big article written in the Montgomery County paper I've still got a copy of it at home me and a deacon went and caught the guys red handed while they were trying to to pot it into a pawn shop all the stuff they took from us on a Saturday night they went Monday morning trying to pot it in. And so there we had to go to start not only just locking the door, we had to go to living, uh, living with an alarm system so that people wouldn't steal from the church. Now let me say this to you real carefully. I grew up in a, in a time in, in the 80s and 90s and, and we would have never thought, and you all grew up in days like this, that you might have stole from a lot of places. If you were hungry and you were going to feed your kids, you might steal some bread if you needed it. You might go somewhere and you might uh, find a money uh, laying around somewhere that wasn't yours and you might take it, stick it in your pocket and go on. But you would have never, ever, whatever it was, you would have never took it from the church house because you had a reverent fear that if you took it from the church that God was going to strike you down. Amen? Amen. Amen. These cats didn't. They just come right on in, took it all. Took everything that we had. If you haven't noticed, in America in 2021, the family has been under attack. Not just in 2021, but the family has been under attack for quite some time. The nuclear family, a mom, a dad, children. If America is going to survive and also thrive, it will require a moral revival of the American family. I really believe this. The old expression is the family goes, so goes society. Because the family unit is the heart of our society. The government needs, the government needs to get out of the way and let the family do the job. Uh, with the exception of cases of, of uh, child abuse or wife abuse, things like that, where they need to step in and help. But most of, most of the, the family unit can handle things with inside of the family. As we look today to, as the family goes, let's talk about some things here this moment. Is If the family goes in the right direction, the country goes in the right direction. But unfortunately, our families are not going in the right direction today. 50% of all, uh, well, not 50%, now it's up to 60%. 60% of all families' uh, marriages end in divorce. Now, when I got into the ministry, it was 40. So in 30 years, it's gone from 40 to 60%. Now, it's not just in the world, because that number was 40% in the world back in the day. It is 60% in the world, 60% in the church. 60% of all marriages end in divorce. Why? Aside from, aside from uh, abuse, uh, adultery, fornication, things like that, the majority of Americans, listen to it carefully, because I've done a lot of marriage counseling over 30 years. A lot of Americans go into marriage thinking, if this don't work, we'll just get a divorce. They go in with that attitude. Young people go into that with this attitude. Well, if it don't work out, we'll just start over. We're going to get us another one. I counseled with a family one time. They were 19 or 20 years old. They sat down and wanted me to marry them. And uh, I said, okay, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, number one, both, neither one of them, man or woman, had a job. I said, how are we going to make this work? He said, well, we're living on love. <laughs> I said, well, you go, to, you go and try to pay your bills the first month on, and tell them that you're in love and it'll be all right. And let's see how far they get you. They said, well, we believe God's going to take care of it. I said, you go to the water company right down there across from the, right down from the church with the water office. I said, you go down there and you tell that woman that you don't have the money to take care of your bill, but Jesus is going to pay it for you. Let's see how long it goes before they block you off. And so a lot of young people go into marital situations, woman out without a plan, we're just going to live on love and we're all going to be happy. Kumbaya is great. No, marriage is hard. Amen? Amen? Come on now. Be honest. It's hard. It takes a lot of blood, a lot of sweat, a lot of tears, a lot of aggravation, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of time. Look at me. I'm gray-headed now after 27 years of being married and 30 years together. 
I'm going to turn gray headed. She's going to have a stitch of gray in her head. I don't know how that happened. But here we stand. Marriage is hard, but you got to work at it. And at the moment when things don't go right, you don't cave up and quit. How did the people like Charlie Garrison and Emma Garrison make it 70 years? They didn't quit. How did Cuddy and Charlotte and Jim and Rose and all those, all of you all that have been married 40, 50, 60 years, how did you make it? Listen, they had hard times. I'm sure if we took time to let them have testimonies, they had times that were struggled, times that they wanted to kill each other, times that they didn't know how they were going to make ends meet, times that they didn't know how they were going to get it together, how they were going to make it. They had, oh, every family does that. I had a man tell me one time, he said, I never, me and my wife have been married 40 years, and we never argued the first time. I thought you were the biggest liar I've met in my life. <laughs> so they asked me to do one of their children's weddings. And so Pam and I were at the wedding rehearsal, and uh, we're standing there waiting to get started. And they, were, you know how wedding rehearsals are. They get tense, and people get aggravated and frustrated. And people stick their nose in that they shouldn't stick their nose in, and this, that, and the other. And so the next thing I know, I look over there, and the husband and wife, they're just snipping at each other. <laughs> and she was, she was going, <laughs> and he was going, <laughs> Next thing I know, she just said, you just get on my nerves. And all she took, and I looked at him, I said, is that number one? <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, we all argue, we all fight, we all, we all make mistakes, we all struggle, we all are human. But we must enter these things as a family with the thing that regardless, we're not going to give up and we're not going to quit. That's how, that's how your parents stay together. That's how your your grandparents stayed together. They didn't quit. Now there's a time, listen, please don't misunderstand me. There are times that you need to walk away from situations. And some of y'all here have had to do that. And I'm not, I'm not, did, did, I'm not putting you down at all. You know, uh, listen, if you had to walk away, you had to walk away. But if you, if you sign up for number two or number three or number four, whichever one you're on, if you sign up for it, please don't go into it with the idea that, well, I got him until I get tired of him. And then when I get tired of him, I'm going to keep him on and I'll go find somebody else. Why? Because as the family goes, so goes our nation. And not just that. As our family goes, so goes the next generation. So goes our children. So goes your grandchildren. See, what, what, uh, what, we, what we're understanding in the Ten Commandments here is that there's a way to live. There's a way to, to conduct ourselves and a way to handle ourselves so that it pleases God, but that it's a benefit to society. It's a benefit to society when there's a mom and a dad in the house. Statistics bear that out. That when there's, a, when there's a, a, a biological mother and a biological father in the house with children, a child has a much better opportunity and statistically has a much better shot of growing up and being successful than they would if they come from a split home. That's statistics. Weighs that all over the place. And so one of the things that we got to get back to is, as a country is, first of all, honoring our parents. This is what uh, Exodus uh, 20, verse 12 says. Honor, honor your father and your mother. Now, what's the promise on the back side of this? It says, honor your father and mother. And on the back side of that, there's something that God says that what he will do. If you honor your father and mother, it says what? That your days may be prolonged on the earth. And so we get a commandment to honor our father and mother. It's the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth which the Lord your God has given you. This is called the first commandment with a promise. There are actually two promises. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 16. You don't have to turn there. We'll have it up on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 16. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord God has commanded you. That your days may be prolonged, and what? That it may go well with you on the land in which the Lord God gives you. And so the second, the second promise here is the first one is that the, the God would extend your days, but secondly, that he, everything would go well. Now we're living in a, in a society, this may be the first or second generation, where this is not happening, where parents are, or parents are not being honored by their children. There's a quick story I want to share with you uh, from uh, Grimm's fairy tale. Maybe you've read it before. There was an older man that had gotten to where he couldn't take care of himself. 
So a son brought him to live with him and his family. The son's wife wasn't too happy uh, about it, when she, but she tolerated it. His hands, the dad's hands were very shaky and at times it was so bad that it would clink his silverware against the table and against the dishes. The wife, she got so upset. She said she shouldn't have to put up with this in her own home. And so she went out and she bought a wooden bowl and put the older man's food in it and set him in a chair in a corner to eat. The older man would sit every day in the corner and eat while the family sat at the table. And one day his hands were shaking so bad that he dropped the bowl on the floor and spilled the food all over the carpet. The wife got very upset and said, That does it. You want to eat like a pig? We'll feed you like a pig. And she made him what looked like a pig trough, put it on the floor, and told him to kneel down and eat. And so he did. So one day the wife called all the family to the table to eat. But their son did not come. So the wife called her son again. It's time for supper. Tommy came in with something that he had made out of wood. He said, look, Daddy, I'm making a trough to feed you and Mama when I get big. The husband and wife looked at each other with tears in their eyes and without a word went over and picked up the older man and led him to the table. It didn't matter how much he clinked he made with the silverware or how much he spilled anymore. The story is we teach a little by what we say, more by what we do, but most by who we are. Moral of the story was the son saw what was going on, and he thought it was a big accomplishment. Look, I've made you a feed trough just like grandpa's, which meant when mom and dad gets old, guess what they're going to be doing? The same thing that they wanted the father to do. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is this, is that the young people are watching, young eyes are seeing, young, vo young ears are hearing what we do with this, inside the, 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 the boundaries of our home. We talk about we want our country better, we want our country changed, we want to see moral values instilled back into the country, and, and it's, it's all true. But we can't wait for Washington to do it. It'll never happen with a political fix. It will happen when we change the hearts and minds of people, the average everyday people, to start living a life that is worthy and honoring of God. God is honored when we, when we honor an older generation. We all will walk the path of aging. We need to honor our parents even at the later stages of their life. When I was, I told you this story, I'll tell you again. Travis was born in 2005. We were almost, I was almost 30, I was almost 31 years old when Travis was born. I tried to hold my wife off until we were 40 years old before we had children at all. Man, I was a dummy. <laughs> I'm there now and I really, Lord, I couldn't have no little kid like that running around. I would, I just want to take a nap on Sunday afternoons. You, you imagine a little kid, come on, let's go. I've got a teenage boy that's energetic, and I should have had him 20 years ago when I could have, when I could have kept up with him, but I wanted to wait till we were 40. But at, at 27, she said, it's either now or never. And so we had Travis, or had Shandy. Then at 31, I had, we had Travis. And, and um, what was I trying to tell you? I don't remember. Something to do with Travis. Anyways, I'll think of it in a minute. There was a time when a nation actually adhered to the fifth commandment. You remember that? Honor your mother, mother and your father. There was a time in our country. There was a young man who wanted to join the Navy, to see the world, maybe become a captain of a ship. His mother was not too thrilled that the son of 16 years old was going off to sea. Still, mom walked in to the port. As he said goodbye, he seen that mom was not too happy. Mom didn't have any peace and she really wished he wouldn't go. How do you think the, the child of 16 years old responded? He got his stuff and he said he couldn't break his mother's heart. And so he went back home. He never became a captain of a ship, but he did command the entire Navy as well as an entire armed forces. Who was he? 
George Washington, who had been taught the Ten Commandments as a child. Honor, as we honor our father and our mother, God kept his promises that it may go well with you who, who has honored himself as the great father of our nation. God honored him because he honored his father and his mother. Daniel Webster, the 19th century senator, said this, America has furnished to the world the character of Washington. And if our American institution had done nothing else, that alone would have been entitled to them the respect of mankind. What was the wellspring of his character? He was a man who took the word of God seriously as taught to him by his parents. Well, what about us today? What do we say about who we are? Do we have the character of Washington? Or have we become a nation of individuals? Remember the last week when we looked at Romans, the last time we looked at Romans 1? Look at Romans 1 with me again. I pulled that in there. I want you to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 30. Notice what this says. When they've forgotten the knowledge of God. I won't go back and read all that, but go back and read the, the Romans chapter 1 where he talks God gave them over to a depraved mind and they become slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, and what? Disobedient to parents. Most homes are now raising children that have zero respect for the parents. You don't have to go too far but to the grocery store to see that that's the case. And don't think I'm talking about non-Christians. Because sadly, today, there's not a lot of difference between Christian homes and secular homes. Ephesians 6.1, Paul says this. Ephesians 6.1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1. Children, obey what? Why? If you obey the Lord, why? It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Honor your parents. It's the right thing to do. In our permissive age, some parents are saying that they don't want to force their children to honor them. We just want to be friends. i got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. The biggest mistake you'll ever make is being friends with your children before it's time to be friends with them. There will be a time to be friends with your children, but when they are little, growing up, impressionable, when they become teenagers and they're influenced by everything in the world, that is not the time to be their friends. It's the time to be their parents. Amen. And so I've often told my children, we'll be friends one day, but not today. Because today I'm still your dad. And the kids will tell you, the only time that I get really the most upset with them is when they talk sideways to their mother. They know if they do that, now most of the time they've learned by now they don't say it in my presence. But they also know that if they say it at all, mom's going to tell, tell dad what has been said. And dad's going to come around the corner and he's going to put the fear of God, the hammer down. I told Travis, I said, there will be a day that you can take this old man, but today is not the day. I may be broke down, but I'm not completely down. I may have a bad back, but I still got spunk. I still got ability. And as long as I've got strength in my body, I will defend your mother's honor with everything that I have. She is your mother. She almost died having you. You will honor her and respect her. Why? Because she gave you life and she brought you in this world. She can take you out. Instead, we allow children in this day and age to decide for themselves what they want to do. It says, when does a child know what's good for them? There's nowhere I can find a scripture that says that we are to let our children decide for themselves about anything. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Now I say that as, I think I, do I have that in there? Galatians chapter 4, there it is. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In other words, what he says, he might be able to inherit it all. You might have millions coming your way. But until you come of age, you're not smart enough to handle it. You're not mature enough to handle it. You, you would just blow through it. My son uh, worked hard and he bought a truck. And uh, man, he just now he buying the accessories all over the place. And I said, stop. <laughs> stop. Whose money do you think you're going to use on this? 
Well, I'm going to use mine. I said, son, you got $35 in the bank. Who's, who do you think you're going to use? Yours? <laughs> Not mine. No. You had to get a job. You had to work. You want to do something. So thus he works with the neighbor on the farm. Honor our father and our mother. A well-known secular pediat pediatrician and author, somebody, some of y'all may have heard of his name, Dr. Benjamin Spock, said children should do whatever they want to do. Parents don't tell them what to do. The important thing is let, to let it all hang out, self-expression. That's what he said. And with that, he has helped produce the most rebellious and disobedient generation in the history of our nation. However, in Dr. Spock's old age, before he died, he actually admitted that he was wrong. Saints, when a child does not respect their parents at home, they're not going to respect their teachers in school or anybody else in authority. If we teach them at a very young age that they uh, should respect their parents, it will carry over in every walk uh, area of their life. Honor your father and your mother. Now, hold it just a second. You say, well, now, I don't have a very good one. I don't have a very good mom or a very good dad. The Bible doesn't say you honor them if they're, if only if they're good and only if they're bad. That's not what the Bible says. Honor them for it's right. Honor them because that's the right thing to do. And so you might have bad, you might have bad parents. I understand that. That doesn't mean that we're going to cozy up and hang out every five minutes of the day, but you honor them anyways. You do the right thing. You honor them as your mom and dad. Don't talk bad about them and talk, kick them under the bus and all that stuff. You treat them the right way. I told you, I, I know what I was going to tell you about Travis now. When Travis was, uh, I was in my 30s when we had Travis, and uh, Travis was uh, playing t-ball. We wanted him to sign up for t-ball, and he, he said, Dad, I'll play t-ball if you promise you'll be at my games. And I said, absolutely, son. I'll be, I'll be at every one. And so... One, this particular, particular t-ball season that he played, he had a game on Wednesday night. Of course, everybody knows what Wednesday night is, right? Church night, Bible study. I, I was pastoring the church at that time, and uh, so I went to the, my guys and said, listen, I won't be here Wednesday night. I'm going to watch my son play t-ball. So I got another guy that's going to teach it, and he taught the class, and everything went along. It, it was hunky-dory. We didn't, we didn't shut the church down. We didn't stop because I wasn't there. That's the way church ought to be. It ought to keep on running, even the preacher's there or not. I asked somebody, they filled in. But when I got back, I had a man stop me. And he said, I just wanted you to know that I'm leaving the church. I said, okay. If that's what you want to do, that's... You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with you if you want to leave. And, you know, there, there's not any other churches in that county. I said, go find you one and be happy. I said, but tell me exactly why you want to leave. And this was what he said to me. I'll never forget it. He said, I cannot sit underneath a man that puts his family ahead of God. I said, what do you, what, what do you mean? Explain to me what you mean. He said, you took off Wednesday night to go watch your son play uh, t-ball, did you not? And I said, yes, sir. He said, you put your family ahead of God, and I, you're no man of God. I can't sit underneath you. To which I responded. I, said, I called his name, and I said, is it a fact that we had Bible study here on Wednesday night? He said, yes, sir. I said, is it a fact that we had somebody teach Bible study here on Wednesday night? He said, yes, sir. I said, did you learn anything from the guy that was teaching Bible study? He said, yeah, I learned a lot. I said, did it go on? Did the show go on just as if I was, what, as if I was here? He said, yes, it did. I said, so you didn't miss out on anything, right? He said, no. He said, but, but you weren't here. You're, you, I said, listen, be careful. You have my blessing to leave. Matter of fact, that's probably what you ought to do if you feel that way about it. Because here's the deal. I got one shot at raising these kids. That's it. One shot. And I look back now, and Shannon's out on her own going to college. Travis will be 17 his next birthday. And those 17 years have flew by like that. I got one shot at raising these kids. And long after you're dead, sir, these kids will be here to decide what they're going to do with me when I become your age. And what happens to me when I become your age is a lot going to depend on a lot what I do with them now. And I'm, I'm working now and being there now, so hopefully if I have to go to the old folks' home, it won't be the one that stinks real bad. They'll put me in one that's got a five-star rating like a, like a home real good. They'll take care of the old man because he was there. 
A lot of the problem in the world today and society today is the fact of absentee fathers. There's fathers that are they're not there. They might, they might work too much or work too hard. Listen, you've got one shot at raising young children and then they grow up. Be present, be available, be there. I don't regret for one second taking off and going watching my boy play ball. Because one day he's going to be in charge of what happens to me. Parental roles in America are under attack today. Motherhood is in a total disrespect today. It used to be a good thing to be like June Cleaver, stay home mom, take care of the family. It was considered an honorable and respected thing to do. It used to be uh, respectable to be a grandma, and now grandma got more swing on her than, than the young people do. Grandma got to go into the club. Grandma getting her groove on. Grandma, don't, you can't tell no difference today between grandma and you and a young woman. She thinks that she wants to grow old, but she wants to grow old gracefully. I cannot imagine the grandmother that I had, the great grandmother that I had, who wore a, 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 a apron all the time, trying to go to a club and hanging out. They just can you imagine your grandmama going to a club and hanging out and a party and carrying on? Can you imagine that? Think about that for just a minute. Your grandmama. But this is what grandmothers today are trying to do because women don't want the role of a June Carter or June Cleaver. They want, they want to be cool. They want to be accessible. Uh, but listen, it was used to be a respectable thing. And I think one thing in our society has done, we've priced our way out in society away from the mom staying in the household. And I think if anything, the, the society has suffered because mom can't be there to watch the kids grow up. That's a sad thing, but that's where we're at. Psalms 113.9 says, He maketh barren the woman to keep the house, and a joyful mother of children, praise you be to God. Proverbs 31.10, a wife of noble character who can find. She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her, and he lacks nothing of value. Wife of noble character. Lady, it's still all right to be married to one man. It's still all right to be a, a woman of character. It's still all right to, to grow and, and to grow old gracefully and be a, be a woman and husband has full confidence in her and he lacks nothing. She brings him good and not harm all the days of his life. But today, motherhood is considered a lonely job. Can't do any better. It's just one of them things. Yet look at what Theodore Roosevelt said about mothers. He said, mothers are the most precious asset of any nation. They are more important than statesmen or businessmen or any occupation on the earth. The most important thing a woman can do with her life is to pour herself into her children. Teach them the ways of God so they will grow to be respectable, godly members of society. What about fathers? Well, it doesn't take a, a whole lot of smarts to become a dad, does it? Huh? No. Uh, any man can become a father, become a dad. And unfortunately in America, a lot of men have done just that. They become dads, but they never become fathers. One of the most important parts of the family's ability to survive is to have a father in the home. God made man and woman to be together to be helpmates in raising children and in stabilizing the home. In our society today, 60% of homes are without a father because the father's abandoned his responsibility. So what happens when there's fatherless homes? Listen to this real carefully. Gang membership is on the rise with over 100,000 teenage boys in gangs in the city of Los Angeles alone. And most of those young teenage boys are armed. And that's true all over the country. 70% of teenage uh, criminals come from fatherless homes. Everybody pays the price when fathers abandon their responsibility. Dad, father, your children need you. And they need to see a strong example of what, a, what it is to be a man. Now, our society doesn't want the John Wayne type of man anymore. I, but I think that's exactly what's needed. The John Wayne, <laughs> you know, the, the grit, tough. I, I'd like so much to quote the movie, but he's got cussing in it, and I can't quote what he said. You can call me daddy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Okay. But he did he told his son, Don't you ever call me daddy? Something like that. Listen to me carefully. Men, you are as important as mom in the house in this regard. Listen to me very carefully. There are little eyes watching you. Little eyes that are boys and little eyes that are girls. Little boys will determine will be determined what kind of man they become based on your character, how they how they grow up. I become the man that I am today by watching what my dad done. I've learned a lot of the qualities from him. I learned a lot of my, my lessons from my mother, but also learned a lot from my father. Men, you are important in the house. And if you've got daughters, listen to me carefully. How many of you men have, have girls around? Listen to me carefully. Every young girl needs to know what it means to be loved by their daddy. Girls, y'all agree with that? If a young lady doesn't find love from her daddy or granddaddy, we can go there too. The unconditional love. She will find love somewhere and possibly she'll find it in the backseat of a car from some slick dude telling her he loves her because she doesn't have the example of what love is. I have tried my best to model what godly, manly love looks like in two ways in our house. I have tried to show my daughter that I love her unconditionally and what a man's love should look like. She knows that for her, a man's love ought to be that the, that the man who marries her has, needs to realize that I have set the example. I've got up and gone to work when I, could, when I barely could drag one leg in front of the other one. When my back was at its worst, I got up and I carried on to meet their needs and take care of their situations. So she knows that I, that I provided for her a no-quit attitude. But I also loved her, and I told her she was a beautiful, and I told her that nobody would love her like her daddy. So she's learned that from me. Our son has learned what it means to be a man. That being a man doesn't mean that you have to fight all the time. You don't have to be big and bad. That you can be lovely. You can be, uh, you can be tender. You can, you can love your wife. You can show her what's right and what's wrong. You can, you can uh, tell her you love her. And I have shown both of my kids, and I'm going to say this to every man in the room, don't be afraid to tell your children you love them. I have stood, listen to me, I'm almost done. I have stood at the head of caskets after caskets after caskets of children who would, after everybody's walked off, they have been just them and me standing at the casket. And I've been at dozens of them that told me, I never heard my daddy say he loved me. Don't be that guy. You tell your children, I love you. You let them know it, it's okay. It's all right to be a man. It's okay to cry. It's okay to do all that. But don't be that guy that when they stand beside your head, I, he, he provided for me, but he never told me he loved me. My kids can't say that. When they call on the phone, last words, I love you. When they come to the house before they leave, I love you. Why? Because I learned that from my mom and dad. They handed that down to me, and I'm handing it down to, to my children now. At the ages of two or three years old, most, most psychologists call gender, the gender, gender identity period. Every male begins to reach out to his father. Why? Because the, of the inner drive to bond with the male species. But if the father's not there, what does the boy do? He turns to his mother. The boy need, boys need masculine influences in their life. They need to be taught what biblical manhood is. Our nation used to be one that valued the family, respected the roles of mothers and fathers. We used to uh, be a leave it to beaver society where the value of motherhood was priceless and seen as a vital necessity. We've now gone from a society that, believed, that didn't believe in divorce to a divorce rate of 65% and that is even in the church. We've now become a society of Beavis and Butthead, Bart Simpson, how to make our parents out to be buffoons and clueless idiots. A nation that does not value the family, a nation of fatherless homes, a nation that calls the unborn child a fetus that has no rights, about 50 million children since 1973. American, the uh, Holocaust, the American Holocaust is eight times greater than the Jewish Holocaust in Nazi Germany. As goes the family, so goes society. 
Mom and Dad, I want to encourage you as we close. Keep it up. Keep fighting. Keep pushing forward. Keep showing the example. Keep showing what Christ, what Christ is like in a family. You may say, well, my children are already raised and what I do now. You pass it on to your grandchildren. You show it to the, your great-grandchildren. You show it to the neighbor's kids. You show it to the church kids. You, but you keep modeling what America needs. America needs strong men and women of character uh, and families to, to stand up, to show up, and to be counted. Because we're going to, down the toilet very quickly. But we need people of character and of courage to stand up and say, I will put my family first. I will put my children first. I will show them what it means to live for Jesus Christ. So goes the family. So goes the nation. And that is left up to us. Not politicians in Washington, D.C. Let's stand up for you. Here we head down the right close across the room this morning. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Help us as families within the family here at the church. Help us today to realize every decision that we make as adults having a reaction to our children. We determine the course of their lives based on the decisions that we make. Father, I realize there's nothing we can do about the past. But we can start right now moving forward in the right direction. Maybe we ne our children have never heard us say that we love them, but we can start that today. Maybe we've put work ahead of everything else. Maybe today we can stop that today. But Father, whatever it might be, let mothers not be afraid to be mothers. Let men and fathers not be afraid to be fathers. I thank you, Father, for a godly family. Thank you, Lord, for the family that I grew up in that taught me and showed me the way. I thank you for the family that my wife has created in our home. And Lord, I thank you for all these mothers here today that are striving their best to raise their children in a way that would honor and please the Lord. Some days it gets hard. Some days we feel like we want to quit. Some days it feels like we've gone as far as we can go, but give us the courage of these families that have been married 40 and 50 and 60 years. And even though we feel like quitting, we know the cost is too high. The damage would be too great. And our responsibility is to not each other. Ultimately, our responsibility is to God himself. Give us the courage to hold on when we feel like giving up. Father, today, thank you for those that are striving Teach our children in the ways of the Lord. Thank you for our young people who are willing to honor their father and their mother. Speak to us clearly. Speak to us individually. But most of all, when we leave here today, may we have resolve to be the people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed across the room.